I'm Justin Roberts of Biz News, and with me today is 10X Investment Founder and our regular Tuesday co-host, Stephen Nathan. Stephen, when it rains, it pours, and there's certainly a lot of ha lot happening from a company perspective today. Possibly most interestingly, Bob van Dyke of Naspers and Process went on another spending spree, purchasing Indian payments gateway company, Buildesk, for 70 billion rand. Not a small acquisition. A company of this side would waltz into the JSE Top 40. Yet another leap of faith in a management team that has little to show for their efforts in the last five years or so. Yeah, without a doubt. And they, 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 they're going on, as you say, unabated where, uh, you know, the big story obviously is their enormous stake in Tencent, which is uh, worth more than all these other investments they are making. And obviously all the challenges that Tencent and other uh, internet companies are having in China uh, you know, with the government having a policy of uh, much more inclusive growth and looking at sort of eroding profit margin. So it's kind of in a way, it's sort of tinkering at the edges. But on the other hand, you know, they can't influence Chinese government policy. So they, they certainly are trying to prove their worth. And as you say, you know, these are, these are eye-watering numbers, uh, you know, an acquisition of in the region of almost 70 billion rand. Uh, and it, it you know, it has no impact on the company. The, the The share price went up a little bit today, but, you know, that's because Tencent went up. So, so you know, they are trying their best. And, um, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting strategy. It's a strategy that, you know, they have pursued for quite some time, trying to di diversify away from uh, Tencent and, and identify the next Tencent. Uh, you know, and as we know, uh, you know, very few companies get that right. We've spoken, for example, uh, in the past with PSG, where they've had, you know, that knockout performance from Capitech. Uh, and it's very difficult to replicate that. So, you know, they are they are trying. It's a lot of money they're spending. And it's hard, you know, um, given the sort of very competitive nature of technology, you know, the challenge you have when, you, when you're investing in sort of early stage technology companies is firstly technology changes a lot. So it's never really clear who the winners and losers are going to be in any uh, space, including this payment space. It's a very, very competitive uh, environment. And then you've also got, not only have you got a lot of great companies there, you've got a lot of great investors. So you're competing with, you know, the smartest uh, venture capital investors from Silicon Valley and all around the world. So, you know, uh, uh, Naspers' ability to, pick the winner in this uh, uh, environment is by no means guaranteed. And just to kind of give you some idea, you might know these numbers, but your listeners might find that interesting. You know, this is a company that uh, um, that was founded in 2000. So it's not a new company. Um, and their profit, their last profit for 2021 was $37 million. So they're buying it on 127 PE and uh, process and 10 cents are both on a 20 PE. So, you know, they're buying companies that are much more highly rated. And that that gives a sense of the competitive nature and also uh, of, I guess you could call it the upside, but also of the risk inherent in such a transaction. There's still a lot of uncertainty in China. No one can accurately forecast what's going to happen there. And as you're saying, Stephen, these high growth tech companies are at all time high valuations. And we've been in a raging bull market for the better part of a decade now. History tells us this can't continue forever. If things turn, it could get seriously ugly for NASPIS with all this M&A activity at the top of the cycle. Yeah, it could be. It could be. But uh, as I said, it's a, you know, in some ways, it's a bit of a sideshow because, uh, you know, they're trading at a discount to the investment in Tencent. So the market, although they've just spent an hour watering almost $5 billion, um, but the, the, the market is not valuing $5 billion at anything. Uh, so, you know, even if these, you know, the market is either saying that these investments are worth nothing uh, anyway. It doesn't matter. You know, whatever the company does, uh, we're giving them no credit for it because they're trading at a discount just to 10 cent. Uh, you know, all the market is saying that, you know, they're going to they're going to they're going to make very poor investment decisions. And these investment decisions aren't going to you know, add uh, any material value overall. Um, but at the moment, you know, um, the market is not giving NASPES management and the board for that matter, you know, any credit in their strategy, because if they were giving credit to, um, you know, the financial engineering and the reverse listings and everything else that's going on, uh, the discount would be a lot narrower than it is. So, you know, management's doing what they can do, but obviously shareholders in the market, you know, are telling them, you know, giving them a very strong alternative message. But at the moment, they're not listening to that message. 
it's almost as if NASPIS is this perfect, perfect private equity like vehicle with billions of rands at its disposal for Bob van Dijk and Basil Sordos to run amok. At the end of the day, a smart man like Kurt Becker must have a lot of faith in them. Yes, well, well, um, you know, the challenge, the challenge with NASPES is that it has a control structure where a very small percentage of the economic interest controls the voting rights. Um, and, and, you know, um, uh, uh, Chris Becker would be in that very elite group. And as you say, you know, they, they, they obviously, I think, have a different agenda. I think that when you're someone like Chris Becker and you've helped uh, build NASPES uh, to what it is, you know, you've taken it from a sort of South African uh, media company into one of the most successful global internet companies. You know, you've got a very different sort of emotional attachment to this investment. Uh, he is independently wealthy. He's a dollar billionaire. Uh, so I think there's 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 sort of all you know there's there's different incentives and motives that drive, let's say, a Kurs Becker. And then if you're sitting as Bob Van Dyke as management, you know you've you're getting incredibly well paid to, you know, play in the internet space, which is something you enjoy, um, you know, but shareholders have a different profile. You know, they're just looking to uh, earn a good return and try and unlock value. Um, but this is not a democratic uh, company in the sense that it's not, it's not one share, one vote. Um, so there's a lot of risk uh, that goes with NASPES and this risk is not new. It's been known, but I think when, you know, in the good times, uh, investors didn't really pay too much attention to the uh, the voting structure or, for that matter, uh, the actual legal uh, uh, viability of what they call these variable interest entities uh, where you don't really own the company in China. You own a right to some of the profits uh, going through the Cayman Islands. So, you know, in the bad times, uh, you know, as Warren Buffett says, when the tide goes out, you know, people, people kind of see who's been swimming without clothes and they pay much more attention to these risks that are not new risks. Uh, they just become much more elevated uh, in our minds. Sort of change of topic from tech to commodities, but Harmony Gold out with results. Without focusing too much on their results as a standalone, do you like to allocate a portion of your portfolio um, in gold as a hedge against uncertainty and things like inflation? Yeah, so, you know, I've never been a big uh, gold bull, uh, you know, and some South Africans will be very cross because we seem to have a big affinity to <laughs> to gold, given our history. Um, you know, gold, uh, you know, it's an interesting asset uh, because, um, you know, uh, in previous sort of decades, uh, when when the world was on the gold standard, there was, you know, there was a use for gold outside of jewelry. It was a store of value that central banks needed to hold. A certain amount of gold in order to control their sort of currency. So, you know, it wasn't just that gold had a value as a precious metal, it had a, it had a, a, an alternative value. And what's really been interesting is that, you know, the world has been off the gold standard for, for many decades now, um, but central banks still like to hold gold as some kind of a store of value and some kind of a hedge. And, and no one's really clear what the hedge is, but they kind of say, well, you know, uh, it's, a, it's, a, uh, uh, it's a store against inflation or it's a store against everything else melting down. Um, but the inherent value in gold outside as a precious metal, uh, there is no inherent value uh, outside, of, uh, you know, outside of what it's worth in jewelry. So it's a, not exactly like cryptocurrency, but it certainly is one where, um, you know, the, the, there's, there's, there's a perceived value as opposed to an actual value because you don't, if you hold gold, it actually costs you money to hold gold because you've got to store it in a vault. It's not as though you get an income. It's not like a property or um, when you own a company, you get a dividend. Um, and if you look at long, you know, the long term track record of gold in dollars has not been great. It's, it's, it's only beaten inflation by a marginal amount. You know, if you look even over the last 30 years, uh, which has been quite a good period for gold, uh, the return in dollars uh, has been under 5% per annum. So it's not a disastrous return, but it's not a great return. Now, obviously, as a RAND, as a South African, you know, you're also getting the um, the dollar strength or the RAND weakness, you know, and that can add another, say, 3 4%. So it's not a terrible return, but, you know, I'm not uh, I'm, I'm not a great uh, gold fan. It's, uh, the, the people that have really made money in gold are those that trade it well because uh, it's really much more of a trading asset than a long-term asset. I mean, if you had to hold the stock market uh, versus gold over any long-term period, the stock market would have done much better. But then there'll be there's always people who said, "Yeah, but I bought gold at you know two hundred dollars and I sold it at you know one thousand five hundred dollars an ounce." Um, but that's more the exception than the norm. 
No, that makes sense, Stephen. I was actually looking at Harmony's 10-year graph. It was like a mountain with cliffs that send you into free fall <laughs> from 100 Rand back to 10 Rand, back to 100 Rand, now at 50 Rand. But another swift change of topic, uh, onto Advertech, they came out with results. They own Varsity College, which is probably the best private education provider in the country. I was at UCT in 2018, and there were many activist groups burning property and causing, often to the extent that classes were shifted to online learning. Do you think there's a big future in the Varsity College-like private education space in South Africa? Yes, I think that, uh, you know, as you say, um, you know, the standard of, of, of sort of government uh, education at the tertiary level uh, is really being questioned. Uh, and I think if you look at our sort of our rankings globally, um, you know, it's not a disaster, but we certainly are gradually, gradually slipping down. We don't have a university that is in the top 100 in any recognized uh, uh, study. Whereas if you went back, you know, maybe 20, 30 years ago, we would have, we, we, we would have been there. So I think there's a, you know, there is an acknowledgement that, uh, you know, universities have to cater for far broader spectrum of, uh, 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 you know, of constituents. And in some faculties, you know, uh, standards are slipping. And as you say, um, you know, the, the, the sort of unrest, I think, uh, uh, you know, had a big impact on people's ability to study and the certainty of studying. Um, and, you know, would definitely mean that, uh, you know, there's an increased need uh, for alternative, uh, you know, private sector uh, education at the tertiary level. So, you know, that, that has been there. But I think in general, if you look at private education in South Africa, both at the, the primary level and or the, 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 you know, the schooling level, if we look at the CURROs and if we look at the tertiary, I think it's been disappointing. I think we've all kind of recognized that, you know, there, there should be quite a big demand for it. But I think there's probably, there's probably two factors uh, that have held back the potential thus far. You know, the one is that, um, you know, if you look at sort of employment stats, um, you know, uh, uh, people, people are not getting wealthier. In fact, they're getting poorer. So there's fewer people that I think that can afford it. I mean, there was a really interesting study uh, that came out. I think it was the UCT Liberty Institute. Um, and they looked, they, they, they looked at from February of 2020, so of last year, to March of this year. Uh, and they, they looked at it by income category. Uh, and sort of, we know that like you know, over a million jobs were lost. So, 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 so that we know. But their their highest category is people earning over forty thousand rand per month. Uh, and in South Africa, uh, in twenty twenty February twenty twenty, there was under just under five hundred thousand uh, individuals in that category. Um, but a year later, that had dropped to just under four hundred thousand. So, so there was almost a 25% reduction in people in that salary band. And so there were fewer people earning the kind of salaries they can afford to, you know, send children to private education. And, and also within that, what happened is that the average actually salary also fell. So the average salary in that band was 64,000 Rand a year ago, and that had fallen to 55,000. So, you know, um, the, the, the economic impact that people are experiencing uh, means that fewer people can go, you know, can 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 actually you know afford it. And I think we've seen that in their numbers. If you look at um, Advertex numbers, they grew something like five percent is in in about twelve to fourteen months. That's the number of uh, students they have both in their uh, schooling and tertiary. So you know the the kind of uptake is not what one would think. Uh, and then secondly, obviously the cost of running universities and 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 having an online and an offline presence because a lot of these universities, you know, you can't just switch down, you know, close off your bricks and mortar. You've got to do both. Uh, so you, you, you don't necessarily have a, a more cost-efficient model. You might have a model that's more scalable, um, but we just haven't seen those numbers come through. Um, so, so it still is a challenging sector, but, you know, hopefully it is one that has, you know, um, good, good promise because the demand is there, but people need the, affordab the affordability to be able to pay these higher prices. Yeah, and to your point, Stephen, Cura actually lost 2% of their um, their base in the middle of the year, students just fleeing as a result of not enough disposable income for education. But lastly, Old Mutual, they released decent interim numbers and declared a dividend. Share is quite nicely up. However, it just seems that this once powerhouse is becoming more and more relevant in the South African financial services industry as the more innovative businesses are eating their lunch. 
Yeah, I think you're right. I think, you know, if you look at sort of, you know, uh, uh, old mutual and, I mean, if you go back, depends on how far you want to go back. But, you know, if we went back, I guess, you know, maybe something like 30 years, you know, you had sort of dominant institutions, you know, had like Anglo-American and South African breweries. And, you know, because of the hothouse effect, because they couldn't invest outside of South Africa, they just kept on plowing their profits back into buying, you know, so a mine would, you know, buy a bank and a life insurance company and, you know, old mutual and Sunland would also be like that. Um, and, you know, what has happened is that, uh, you know, a lot of these companies have, uh, they've unbundled sort of their non-core businesses. So they, their share size is smaller, which is actually good uh, because it does free up the, uh, the, the economy. But as you say, a company like old mutual, the traditional life insurance company uh, is really struggling. They're struggling because of the, uh, the poor macro environment. So as you said, you know, with 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 um, employment falling, uh, you know they've got you know fewer people are able to save. There's fewer people employed, so that means less people on pension funds that Old Mutual would administer. Um, there's also been COVID, so they've had life companies have had a dramatic increase in their claims, so they paid out much more in claims. Uh, they've had the rights to deal with, uh, so it's a pretty it's a pretty difficult uh, environment. Um, and you know if you look at Old Mutual's profit for the six months, you know the the number that are there. Would, would, would focus on is if you look at their, what they call their profit before, uh, before uh, COVID uh, uh, expenses. And that, you know, that, that profit grew 8% uh, in, the, in the six months. And the actual quantum, it, it grew by 330 million. Um, but if you look at the individual components, what they call the mass market, which is the entry level business. So that would be like group schemes, uh, funeral business. Uh, that grew 785 million. So, so that grew 785 million, uh, and the, the overall business grew 330 million, which tells you that everything else actually went backwards. So, like the kind of things that a lot of people, I think, would associate Old Mutual with, maybe uh, their, their their life insurance policies, their wealth business, uh, insure, which is the Old Mutual and Federal, uh, the investment business, uh, the sort of employee benefit business, rest of Africa. That's actually all going backwards. Um, so, so, you know, if you look at it on that basis, it's not a particularly good uh, result at, at, at sort of a divisional level. There was one division that did really well. Uh, and the challenge Old Mutual has is that it's a very mature, large company. Um, you know, the, if you look at their net flows, they also had net cash outflows, which meant that they paid more money out than what they, than what they got, got in. So they are a mature company. But at the same stage, same time, having said that, they're still potentially value in old mutual you know their numbers showed that what they call their sort of embedded value and the appraisal value of all their businesses is in the region of i think they said about 25 rand a share it's about 100 billion rand uh, and their market cap is sort of at uh, uh, their share price is about 15 rand so there is still a value gap but you know they haven't demonstrated an ability to grow profitably and to generate good returns on the capital in that investment so that's the challenge they have I'm Justin Roberts of Biz News, and you've been listening to